Hello, everybody, and welcome to this video on 35 high yield facts for USMLE Step 1, GI Physiology. This is Part 3, Salivary Gland Physiology. Um, this is a six-part video series on the GI Physiology section. Um, again, I made this in one video initially and decided to chop it up. So this will mostly cover salivary gland physiology. If you have not watched the previous videos, I would recommend doing so. There's a Part 1 on upper GI motility and Part 2 on lower GI motility. And if you haven't seen the video on GI anatomy and histology, I would also recommend watching that first before any of these. Um, please like and subscribe for future videos. I always appreciate the support. And if you have any uh, suggestions for videos, please comment below. Okay, let's get started. 14. Saliva leaving acini is typically isotonic. Screen saliva is typically hypotonic. Okay, so we'll talk about why that is in just a second here, but let's just talk about the salivary glands real quick. So the acini are the basic secretory units. So um, let's look at an image here. I'm going to move this image in here. I'm going to move some stuff around. Okay, so this image is of a uh, salivary gland, a portion of salivary gland, and we can see that these sections back here are the acini. So this is a serous one. So serous acini are typically more watery. I see a lot of this in the parotid gland, and the mucinous acini are typically uh, higher in mucus, and we see more of that in the sublingual gland. And anyway, so the fluid is released uh, out of here, and that salivary fluid eventually will go down this duct, and there'll be some absorption and secretion of ions as it goes down the duct. And the three major glands we want to kind of be aware of are, is the parotid gland, which you can see the facial nerve running through here. So that's the parotid gland. And then you have your sublingual gland underneath the tongue, and then you have your submandibular gland. So those are the big three. And we'll talk a lot about their innervation here in a minute. And then if we look at this histologically, we talked about this a little bit in the histology video on GI, but you can see these mandibular glands have kind of a mix of the, the whiter appearance, which is more mucousy, and some of the serous uh, tissue, whereas the parotid gland is very heavy in the darker uh, staining serous um, has more of the darker standing serous acini here, okay? So the parotid gland is more watery for that reason, right, more serous, and the sublingual is predominantly mucus, and the submandibular is mixed between the two. Okay, so let's look at the physiology here. So initially, the saliva is isotonic. Isotonic to what? It's isotonic to plasma, okay? So it comes in, the fluid's isotonic to plasma. As it moves down this uh, duct, the sodium and the chloride are gonna get reabsorbed, potassium is gonna get excreted. During this process, the fluid will become hypotonic because we're losing a lot of our major uh, ions as this is happening. So more chloride and sodium are leaving than this potassium is coming in. The water can't leave, and so you end up with a hypotonic solution. Um, the uh, There is some bicarb that's not shown. Oh, here it is, the bicarb. The, there's also bicarb that's secreted. The bicarb um, acts as a uh, buffer for uh, stomach acid, essentially, because, you know, eventually you're going to reach the, um, the stomach, and like we said, the acid is very high there, so you want to start getting some bicarb in as soon as possible, and that happens here in the salivary tissue. It's also pretty good for oral health. So anyway, so the secreted saliva is hypotonic uh, as it leaves the duct. 15. At higher flow rates, saliva becomes more isotonic. So going back to our previous image, so let's just say, right, um, you know, same concept. We have some isotonic fluid and it comes down the duct. Let's say it came down the duct really, really fast. If it comes down the duct really, really fast, it's hard for these other ions to sufficiently, you know, uh, get reabsorbed. And it's hard for, you know, these other ions to get secreted. And so because of that, if it's a really high flow rate, we're going to end up with a more isotonic uh, you know, solution that gets released from the duct than we would if it was a really slow passage, right? If, if the fluid's coming down here really slow, then there's plenty of time to reabsorb uh, ions. Now, this concept is makes sense right now, hopefully, um, but it's the opposite, kind of, generally speaking, when you talk about the pancreatic ducts. So we'll talk about why that is. But if you can just remember that concept I just explained about how fast the fluid is going and how much time it gives for reabsorption, that's kind of how I always organize this in my brain. So fast moving, not a lot of time to do any reabsorption and secretion, so it's more isotonic. Slow moving fluid, lower flow rate, right? More hypotonic because there's more time relative to modify this um, saliva fluid. 16. Calacrine is responsible for increasing salivary blood flow. And so we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, so in, in initial digestion, right, we eat, you know, we eat something and we start talking about, you know, salivary digestion, right? So alpha amylase is the classic um, enzyme you want to be aware of that starts breaking down carbohydrates. It breaks them down at these 1,4 glycosidic linkages we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute and then prepares those substances for digestion in the brush border, okay? Um, lingual lipase also starts breaking down lipids but doesn't have a, a major major role really yet. Um, the lipase, pancreatic lipase, however, is going to be uh, much more significant. Then there's the substance calacrine. So you might remember, I've, I've done a video on like um, uh, angioedema talking about calacrine. And calacrine essentially uh, allows the conversion of these low to high weight molecular uh, molecular, excuse me, uh, kininogens to be converted to bradykinin. Now recall bradykinin uh, causes, you know, pain, 
vasodilation, hyperpermeability. Um, so those are some classic features we get when, you know, you know if, some, if you injure yourself or you hit your elbow and you might have an upregulation of bradykinin and that's that would be responsible for pain and vasodilation to that area. So what does that have to do with the GI system? So the bradykinin can bind to two different receptors, okay? There's a type 1 receptor, which is kind of like the classic bradykinin that we talk about. If bradykinin binds to the type 2 receptor, the BR2 receptor, it causes vasodilation. That vasodilation at the BR2 receptor increases salivary blood flow. Um, and, you know, increases in salivary gland activity result in this increase in calocrean so that you have more bradykinin and more um, blood flow to that salivary gland. So if you're using the salivary gland more, typically there will be an upregulation of that calocrean. Um, and the other thing I wanted to put here is that IgA are also is also released by acinar cells since I talked about these other enzymes. So IgA, when we're thinking about mucosal tissue, right, we're usually talking about uh, IgA as our, as our major antibody that you want to be aware of at the mucosal tissue. 17. Facial nerve can be damaged during parotidectomy. So let's take a quick look at the parotid gland here. So again, the parotid gland is situated um, kind of in this um, more temporal region here, and you have the uh, facial nerve that is going to run through the parotid gland. So it's literally running right through the gland. The um, parotid gland receives uh, innervation from sympathetics and parasympathetics. And the kind of nice thing about, um, you know, the stimulation of the salivary gland, so the parotid, the submandibular, the sublingual, is they actually all have the same sympathetic nervous system innervation. Now, do you have to know every single detail here? You know, probably not, but you should know certain things. So let's just talk about it really quickly. So the innervation to the um, parotid gland, to the submandibular gland, to the sublingual gland, the sympathetics come from T1 and T3. They synapse, the preganglionic fiber synapse on the superior cervical ganglion. Okay, you should know that, right? So in general, things up here will typically be superior cervical ganglion. And um, there's going to be postganglionic fibers that will uh, use norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter, and they will bind to beta adrenergic receptors on these tissues, right? And, and those and beta adrenergic receptors, right? Go back to your biochem. Those typically will be um, G alpha, right? So that'll be adenylate cyclase that increases CAMP, and eventually this will all cause salivary secretion. Okay. So like fight or flight kind of thing. Now uh, let's talk about increases in salivary secretion in the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so this is where it gets a little more complicated. I know this diagram looks scary, but it's really not that bad. We'll talk about it. So first off, the there's two nerves here. So you have cranial nerve 7, right? Facial nerve, cranial nerve 9, right? Glossopharyngeal. Okay, so the superior salivatory nucleus, we'll go on, we'll do this side first. The superior salivatory nucleus is going to send a signal, right, through cranial nerve 7, through the corda tympani, right? This can go kind of through that, through the uh, region towards the ear, right? So corda tympani, and it's going to eventually go down to the submandibular ganglion. And during this process, the corda tympani will eventually have this kind of branch here that it forms the lingual nerve. Okay, so corda tympani to the lingual nerve and eventually will synapse here at the submandibular ganglion. Okay, and then this will send a signal to the sublingual and submandibular gland. So that's your parasympathetic innervation. It starts at cranial nerve 7 at the superior salivatory nucleus, goes to the corda tympani, goes to the lingual nerve. A way they can kind of come at you with these questions is, you know, a person is, I don't know, a person is doing, uh, you know, a surgery on a, on a patient, right? And then, you know, they, they ligate the corda tympani, right? Or they ligate the lingual nerve. What effect, downstream effects will that happen? So you kind of have to know some general concepts as to where these nerves go and what they do. And so the parasympathetic innervation here um, is for the sublingual and submandibular glands. Okay, now the inferior salivatory nucleus is going to send a signal through cranial nerve 9, and this will eventually go through the um, tympanic nerve. Okay, so that's kind of going up through this region. And that will eventually form the lesser petrosal nerve. Okay, lesser petrosal nerve, and that will synapse onto this otic ganglion. And the otic ganglion will send a signal through the auriculotemporal nerve, to the parotid gland. Now, what's really interesting here, and I hope, and hopefully this doesn't um, confuse you too much, but the facial nerve runs through the parotid gland, right? We just said that. The facial nerve runs through the parotid gland. But the facial nerve is not directly responsible for the autonomic innervation of the parotid gland. Does that make sense? So the facial nerve runs through it, but the facial nerve actually, it's cranial nerve 7, sends its fibers, these fibers, these branches out, specifically to the sublingual and submandibular glands. Okay. Whereas cranial nerve nine sends its signals to the parotid gland. Okay. So kind of tricky. So kind of keep that in mind. Those would be some interesting questions to ask. Um, so yeah, so I think that's all that I have to say on that. And again, just keep your pathways in mind. Just remember that, um, you know, when we see these synapses, like on the submandibular gland, right, this is parasympathetic nervous system. So just remember that these would use uh, acetylcholine 
right? These are the muscarinic receptors that cause the salivary secretion increase here, whereas the sympathetics would use norepinephrine, and those would be beta-adrenergic G-alpha cascades. Okay.